I'm so excited to begin my experience in Booktube by participating in ShakeTube 2019, and especially by joining Kelly's read-along of Tina Packer's Women of Will, Following the Feminine in Shakespeare's Plays. When Packer chose the title, Women of Will, she was thinking of at least three different things. First, of course, are the female characters created by William Shakespeare, as well as the women who are part of his life. Second, she's thinking about how the women express their will, their desire to use power, or their desire to subvert it in some way. Finally, she's using the Elizabethan meaning of the term will, having to do with sexual desire or sexuality more broadly. Tina Packer argues that Shakespeare's portrayal of female characters developed over the course of his life and could be divided into five distinct periods, which she calls acts. Today I'm going to talk about Act One, a time period which Packer, along with many, many literary historians, assumes contains the history plays Henry VI, Part One, Two, and Three, as well as Richard III, and three comedies, Taming of the Shrew, The Comedy of Errors, and Two Gentlemen of Verona. Packer claims that, quote, in these early plays, history or comedy, the women belong to roughly two types. They're either ferocious, overbearingly assertive, or they're idealized virgins on the pedestal. Tina Packer argues that in Taming of the Shrew, we see that under the guise of comedy, the most horrible acts are perpetrated on a woman. It's a nightmare because sexism is so completely accepted. It's simply the way it is. Nowhere is it questioned. I too really struggle with this play, although I've seen some wonderful performances where directors and actors have managed, more or less, to convey alternate readings of the patriarchal violence, which seems to be inherent to the play. I was especially intrigued with the non-traditional adaptation, part of the Shakespeare Retold series starring Shirley Henderson and Rufus Sewell. By the end, both characters learn to quit protecting themselves by inflicting cruelty on others, and instead, learn to start to open their hearts. I'll link down below. In the Comedy of Errors, suggests Parker, we see portrayals of women that are significantly less developed than the portrayals of women in later plays. Their characters are flat and stereotypical. Certainly she's right here. Adriana is a jealous and angry woman drawn by Shakespeare with a very blunt instrument. My skepticism about Parker's interpretation that Shakespeare does not yet have any meaningful understanding or respect for women at this point, though, is that all the characters in the Comedy of Errors, both the women and the men, are flat and stereotypical. He has animated archetypes rather than created the deeply human characters we begin to see in his later plays. The fact that the characters are underdrawn is part of the point. Um, this play is a zany, madcap adventure of misidentification. The fact that we can't tell the difference between the main characters relies on the fact that there really isn't a difference between the characters. They don't have different physical characteristics. They don't have different personalities. And one pair of characters don't even have different names. The author of Women of Will writes, quote, all three plays, meaning Taming the Shrew, Comedy of Errors, and Two Gentlemen of Verona, are extreme in their treatment of women and show how women should be treated by fathers and lovers. Perhaps so. Certainly Shakespeare does not write a clear condemnation of misogyny at the end of the plays. But on the other hand, I don't see Shakespeare creating a clear support for these positions either. In Two Gents, we've gotten to know the female characters and to identify with or root for both Sylvia and Julia. It seems to me that audience members might be shocked and Shakespeare might have intended for them to be shocked by the horrible treatment of especially Sylvia. I don't think it's a ridiculous reading to suggest that what Shakespeare is showing is not how men should treat women, but how men often did treat women. I would argue that Shakespeare's evolution in his creation of female characters was not necessarily because he came to understand and respect women more. Perhaps he matured as a playwright. He began to write plays that depended on the deep humanity of his characters, both male and female, rather than just relying on madcap comedy with zany plots. We've already started to see uh, that move to more character-driven comedy plots by the time we reach Two Gentlemen of Verona. But we're going to see much more as we go forward to Twelfth Night and Much Ado About Nothing and As You Like It. 
His characters in those plays, perhaps especially his female characters, have personalities and motivations and even a kind of interiority that hints at even greater depth. I won't go into detail here, but the women of the Henry VI plays and in Richard III are more complicated than I think Packer sometimes implies. Strangely, in her actual analysis, Packer is pretty clear about how strong and thoughtful the female characters are in these history plays. Her argument loses its clarity here as far as I'm concerned. During a section of the book called The Interlude after Act I, Packer claims that Shakespeare understood women completely. He wrote as if he were a woman, embodying them, giving them full agency. Her question is why this happened, and her answer, quote, I think the answer is he fell in love with someone who possessed qualities unimaginable to him previously. Suddenly, his love for the dark lady of his sonnets, who Packer thinks she's identified, allows Shakespeare to understand all women and empathize with all women. Quote, from the dark lady, he finally got it about women. Hmm. And why didn't his wife, Anne Hathaway, help him, quote, understand women with no evidence? Packer suggests that Shakespeare's marriage to Anne Hathaway uh, when he was 18 years old and she was 26 was thoroughly conventional. His wife clearly was meant to follow the rules, writes Packer. I'm not convinced by this assumption. While it might be true, a marriage between an older woman and a very young man might mean she had experience to share, guidance to give, perhaps even some real power in their relationship. I don't know if she did, but suggesting that a lack of evidence is proof that it was a conventional marriage seems pretty flawed in this time when we don't have much clear evidence for much of anything in social history. I find Packer's gender argument very frustrating. Packer seems to imply that there are very different and eternal differences between men and women, immutable differences, not affected by history or culture or generation. Shakespeare, she states, may have understood women because, quote, a woman was describing to him how it felt to be a woman. This kind of binary gender system with two opposing monolithic extremes is really not how feminists see gender. Perhaps similarly to the way Packer sees women as a stable and unified group, she seems to see playwrights in a similar way. She sometimes believes she can channel Shakespeare because of her own experiences on the stage. It's playing in the playhouse that allows me to go to the depths, she says in the prologue. And later she repeats, quote, I know of what I speak. But then again, historical accuracy is really not her goal. As she writes, I don't know if everything is accurate in this account, but I'm dealing with the events in the way Shakespeare dealt with events, taking the events themselves and using them to stimulate the imagination so a story can be told. Despite my enormous reservations about her arguments, many of Packer's individual creative insights are interesting and thoughtful. I'm sort of looking forward to act two. See you soon.